Thank you, and hello everyone. Hello. <laughs> the last speaker asked how many content writers were in the room. I'm just going to say, you don't have to be embarrassed of the word. Who's a blogger? Good, you're very brave people to admit it. Good, that's good. And how many people are blogging for business? Looks like more of you are blogging for business than said you were a blogger. Mm, interesting. Okay, the name of my talk was going to be Supercharge It, How to Revitalize Your Blog Pen Content for More Exposure and Sales. And then, God, I was bored reading that title. So I came up with a new one. It's How I'm Winning My War Against This Dude, The Content Gremlin. Same content, just, just a different title. A couple of years ago, um, I'd been blogging for a long time. Before 2009, I was blogging. And a couple of years ago, I just sat down and I went, this, this is probably something you know about. I had this feeling that I was wasting my time and my business. This guy, content gremlin, got to me. He was sitting on my shoulder and he was making me say things like, blogging is a waste of time. He was saying, you're not making any sales from blogging. It's just a hobby and it's taking up your working week. He was saying... You're too busy to be blogging. Sound familiar? Somebody mentioned imposter syndrome earlier. It was a severe case of that. So what happened was I started losing interest. I started blogging a little bit less. I'd try and rush the process. I'd convinced myself somehow that I was wasting money. And what I had, wasting money, wasting time. And time is money. Um, and then I had a light bulb moment. I had a light bulb moment. I was like, well, Actually, all I need to do is be a little bit more strategic about what I do and be able to prove to myself that I'm not wasting time writing blog posts. Well, at the time I had 50,000 visitors a month, so I had a lot of visitors coming to my website. I had lots of content and a lot of good content. I'm boasting a little bit, but, you know, it was pretty good. I had a small engaged social media audience, but I wasn't using it strategically at all. And that 50,000 people, I think it's like something like 50% of those people were coming to one post on my blog. They were coming, they were reading it, and they were leaving. They were never becoming customers. And what's worse, that blog post was full of bad information, but I was terrified to take it down because that was half of my website traffic, right? But I knew I needed to bite the bullet. I knew I needed to start being strategic so that my blogging would actually, I could prove that it was working. So who wants to know how to use your blog content strategically? Okay, first things first. I'm not going to ask you to write any new content. If you've got a bank of content on your blog already, you can just do these few things and it will help you get there. For those of you that are starting out in blogging, sorry, you will have to write some content. But this is a process you can go through at any point. Okay, so firstly, what do we want? Oh, sorry, God. I killed the content, Gremlin. I put all these animations in. I may as well watch them. There he is. <laughs> I decided to get strategic. He's there to tell me I'm wasting my time. I should just go... I don't know how else I'm going to generate business, but I should just go to a Chamber of Commerce meeting or something. They're great, aren't they? should go to those. That's what the content branding wants. Okay, so what do we want? We want more brand awareness. We want more people to know about our business because unless people know about our business, they can't buy from us. That's a fact. You know, they don't know us. We want more referrals, more people telling people to come to us because we are the people who know what it's about. Hire us. And, of course, we want more sales because that's what drives a business at the end of the day. How do we get that? The biggest foe of gremlins, you might think it's water or... What is the biggest foe of gremlins? They yeah, duplicate in water. <laughs> Sunlight. Okay, it's not. It's not. I'm telling you, I know for a fact that the biggest foe of gremlins is pirates. <laughs> pirates. Because pirates go, Arr! and this is my pirate method, because I just can't be serious for five minutes. This is my pirate method for getting rid of gremlins. Number one, you audit your blog content. Number two, you reformulate your blog content. Number three, 
you rehash your blog content. Number four, you repurpose your blog content. Number five, you reignite your blog content. Uh, then you've got to get evaluating. And then you've got happy face, because I need an H. <laughs> so let's go through the pirate method. Number one, auditing. Yeah, okay, we're all ready for it. Let's just give up on this uh, blogging thing altogether. Auditing sounds like a load of hassle, but actually this is kind of a nice refreshing thing, a bit like spring cleaning. I hate cleaning, but spring cleaning can be good because you feel great afterwards, right? So audit your blog. List all your blog posts. There are tools that can help you do this. I tried Screaming Frog and then I just threw the Excel away and went and did it manually because actually I needed to go through each individual post and rank them. So I gave them ranking scores. Were they related to my business or my customer? Because not every blog post has to be about your business, but it certainly needs to be attracted to your customer. If that's a yes, you can give it one point. Are they good? Well, of course they're good. I wrote them. But sometimes you need to be a little bit more objective than that. Have a good look through it. Is it actually a good post? Show it to someone else maybe if you're not sure. If it's good, that's another point. Number three then is to decide whether, if it's not meeting those parameters, whether you should trash it or whether you should rehash it. So, to trash a post, have a look at it and decide. Is it out of date? So that post that was bringing me in half of my traffic, it was out of date, it was also bad information. So I had to trash it. It was gone. 25,000 visitors overnight. Gone. That hurt, I have to say. And at the end, I have the happy face. I didn't write that. Um, bad reader match. Is the content just completely irrelevant to anything? Or maybe it's too technical for my reader. Is it too short? Is it 100 words with a few photos? You know, that's not really going to engage your reader for long enough for them to know that you're interested. And also, we you know, search engine-wise, search engines like longer content. Is it blabbery? Does it go on a little bit too much, like I might today? If it does, if you've just buffered it out, somebody told you that blog posts for search engines have to be 1,000 words long, actually 1,500 apparently, 3,000 is even better. Wow, I'm just going to fill this all with rubbish. If that's the case, trash it. It's going to be too much of a rewrite. To rehash it, the ones that you can keep and just do a little bit of work on are ones that are still relevant. Not out of date, not bad information, actually good. Great advice. If you've got a piece of great advice and you just rework, you worded it really badly, you can keep that one. Is it matched to your ideal reader? Can it be made, if it's too short, could you make a 500 word blog post out of that? Now, that's totally up to you how long you want your blog post to be. I think 500 words is long enough to engage someone enough with your content to remember that they're on your site. And um, also, it's not too long because we know people have, haven't got a big attention span. They don't want to scroll through their phone for half an hour to get to the bottom of the post. So I think at least 500 words is what you're looking for. And is it to the point? Does it say one thing? One thing that you should take away from reading that blog post? And that's a big mistake. I think particularly you probably all know your stuff here. And it's very easy just to go into deep detail into every section of everything you need. But for a reader, that's confusing. So try and find the one thing that you want people to learn from the blog post and focus on that. So we're on to step two now. We've got the information we need. We just need to re... That's me trying to do a pirate. Reformulate. Reformulate. So what do you sell? Make a list of what you sell. And I'm not talking about that marketing stuff we talk about. I sell peace of mind. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm actually looking for what you actually sell. What products and services do you sell? Make a list of those. And once you made a list of those, you can put them into your content bucket. You can find your blog posts that relate to those different products and services and split them up into your different buckets. Cat picture, who's on Team Cat? I'm also on Team Dog, just... My cats would kill me if I said anything else. Okay, so Trello has been mentioned twice today already, so I know you're all over it. Trello is a great planning tool. You can go in there 
and you can mark out your products. So I've got dogs, number one there, you see, cats, rabbits, hampers, and fish. So now I just need to go and make a little Trello card for each of my blog posts that fits into those categories. And then if I don't have enough, I can put in some blog posts that I need to write. The nice thing about Trello is you can tag stuff so you know which ones you've done and which ones need to be worked on. And then you've got a really good picture if, if it was me and I sold pets, the cat column would be down here. The fish column would have nothing in. So you really need to think about how much content you've got for each of those. And then map them out. Map them out into monthly themes. And this really helps you and it helps your reader too. Because when your reader sees that you're sharing out or writing content every day for a month about cats. They know your thing is cats, right? And then next month you do dogs. And after a while they slowly get into, this is what the different things that you sell. If you try and scatter bomb it all at once, this is a post on dogs one day, on cats the next. People get confused. So it really helps you focus and it helps your audience focus. But it doesn't have to be a month. You could maybe do a week. You could do a quarter that's based on something. Or you could do it, if you've got very few products like me, you could do it on a launch by launch basis. It's almost like relaunching every quarter for me with a new product or a new course. Step three, rehash. We identified the posts that we wanted to rehash in the trash or hash process. Now, we need to look at the key things that we can improve on the posts that we chose to rehash. Is it on brand? Is your headline going to grab attention? Another big problem. I see so many great blogs with the most ridiculously bad blog titles. And nobody is going to click through to read that blog post if it says cats as the main title of the blog post. Or dogs. I'm not going to bias here. But if it says, you know, um, five ways your cat will annoy you before it's six months old, I'm more likely to click that, right? So headlines are really important. And do you need to edit it? And I'm going to give you a hint here. Yes, you need to edit it. Yes, every time. However much you edit something, it is never fully edited. I used to be rubbish at editing. I used to just give it a quick once over and publish it. I now spend more time editing than I do writing. And here's the thing, it's more fun than writing. Editing is so much more fun than writing. Right, so is it on brand? Your tone of voice. This is something I've only started using in the last six months. Last weekend, somebody read one of these back to me without me telling them what I was trying to do. If you can choose three words that represent your brand or your business, print them out, stick them on a wall, or memorize them, and just make sure that, that ties into everything that you write. And sometimes this isn't an easy exercise. So find yourself a blogging buddy. Sit down with your blogging buddy and work on it together. Sometimes somebody else is able to tell you what you don't know. So I was able to come up with expert and helpful. That was what I was trying to get away with. And my blogging buddy said to me, well, quirky. I'm like, you what? What are you saying? I'm quirky? No, I knew I was quirky. But actually, that's what makes me different, right? Loads of blogs are helpful and expert. If I can add a little bit of my quirk, and I can't help that. I'm a personal brand. I'm a one-person business. I sell on me. So that totally works. That's quirky, I hope, right? I hope you agree. It's not just stupid, right? Right? <laughs> okay, visual style guide is also important. If people can see, land on your blog, and they'll see from the layout of the blog, from the color schemes, the fonts, in your images, everywhere, the same consistent style. They'll start to know it's you, even if they don't see the logo. Somebody said to me, oh, I saw you were running a course there. I knew it was you, because it was your blue. It's not like I've got like a Pantene color or anything. Pantone. Pantene's hair, isn't it? Pantone <laughs> color. I'm pretty sure my hairdresser could tell you my Pantene color. Um, it's not like I've got one of those, but I do consistently use the same color. So you can use, somebody mentioned earlier to grab colors. There's color picker tools, extensions you can get for browsers. You can just go, if you've only got a logo, you can go in and do that. Or you can choose colors and you can identify the hex codes. Write them down. You can use them in almost any graphic design tool that you use, whether it's something like Canva or whether it's like Photoshop. And then find a couple of fonts that you're going to use consistently or typefaces. I never know the difference. Same thing, right? 
you know what I'm talking about anyway. Um, and then I have a third fancy font because when I'm doing my graphics, I want to have something a little bit curvy. That's not going to work, is it, on an internet browser? But for a graphic, that's going to work as well. And if you're consistent with those things, you actually don't need to put a logo on stuff. People just start knowing your stuff. For headlines, my favorite headline tool, I want to show you loads. I've settled on just the one that I use all the time. It's a really catchy name on this one. We had some mentioned earlier. Um, but this one has a very catchy name. It's called the AM Institute Emotional Value Headline Generator. Catchy, huh? And you can see, talk about good design. Well, actually, design-wise, I suppose it works. It's not pretty. It looks like it was made in the 90s. Maybe it was. But what this does is it will evaluate the headline that you put in there for emotional content. We know that people react well to emotional content. You don't have to put in words like crying, <laughs> laughing. There's lots more emotions than those. Um, but if you can try and make the headline about someone, I've noticed if you put in the word you, your, a lot, it would always give you a higher score. The score you're going for, you put in your title, you choose the um, industry that you fit into, and you're going for a score of 30% or more. 30% is good, 40% is great, 50% means you're a very gifted copywriter. I don't often make 50%, so you can gloat if you manage to get there. I mentioned editing. I do a lot of editing now. So basically, I just like put my thoughts on a page, and that takes me about, well, you know, the research takes a while, but that takes me about 45 minutes. And then I probably spend two hours editing because I've just blurted out a load of rubbish. But... There are some tools that really help me. I'll, firstly, I'll do all the normal things. I'll read it through, I'll edit it down, I'll cut out bits. And then I put it into this tool, which is called Pro Writing Aid. And I go into that tool, and it goes, now, this is rubbish, mate. Get rid of all this fluff. And it's sometimes hard. Sometimes you want to argue with it, but it's just a computer program. It doesn't talk back, so it's a bit <coughs> unrewarding. But it will pull out loads of things that you're doing wrong. If you've got too long sentences, if it seems confusing... And it's hard to be quirky with <coughs> pro-writing aid. I'll give you that. It wants to cut out my quirkiness. But actually, when I do cut out a lot of the things it tells me to cut out and I read it back, it's so much a better post. Now, I told you about this. And WordCamp TV will now know about this. Don't tell anyone else because that's my secret. People keep coming up to me going, your writing's got so much better. It's this, it's this pro-writing aid. And I don't go full on 100%. You see, I've got 77 there. I'm happy enough with that. I st there still needs enough quirk in that makes it easy to read. So if I want to fall, no, I can't do the room. Anyone can do it. Repurpose. This is where you need to create content babies. So now you've taken all your old posts, you've decided which ones you're going to keep, you've made them better. Now how else can you make little content babies out of that that will push people back into your blog? that will push your blog further out to new people. Well, things you can do, harder now with GDPR, I almost fainted earlier on when I started talking about Google Analytics, I thought I had it sorted, but <laughs> it's a little bit harder now with GDPR, but create an ebook out of, if you've done a series of blog posts, and I do this quite often, gather them together in an ebook, give it away. You cannot, um, under GDPR rules, just give it away and use their email address. So what I tend to do is you get that, you get a, um, an email um, course when you download it, and then I ask you if you want to join my mailing list after that. I think, she's not in the room, she? <laughs> I think that's GDPR compliant, as far as I've managed to gather. Um, but still, it is a good way to engage someone. Somebody has now got your ebook. They have realized that you're producing good content. But let's move away from that quickly before she does arrive. Um, email sequences. This is what I was talking about. Now you've got those different buckets of content. Could you make a sequence out of those? So I have a, um, a blogging course you can do. I have a Instagram stories course you can do. So if you download my blogging book, you'll also get the course. If you download, I've got a freebie for Instagram stories, you get the course. And all that is, I've managed to sequence out my blog posts that I've written on those topics so that they will have some sort of synergy for a course. <coughs> and then, of course, at the end of that, I ask people if they want to join my mailing list, and if they don't, I unsubscribe them. That's the, the process that we go through. 
You can do similar with a Facebook ads funnel. I said social. I said social. I do Facebook ads. Occasionally I do Twitter ads. I'm dying to try YouTube ads. If anyone has tried them, do let me know because I'm dying to get started. But you can use that same content in a sequence, a funnel that you send out to people on Facebook. Works really well. All from the same content. You haven't yet had to write one blog post. You've had to edit, but editing's fun. And then the little content babies, we can make videos from our blog posts. Now, I know there's not going to be any sound on this, so I can talk. Okay, now there's no sound. I think if I make that quiet, it does feel... <laughs> no, I don't think that's going to work. Okay, so this is a video that um, John Murray Headshots made. It's a tool called Lumen5. You put in your blog link, and it will make a video from your blog link. It has stock images that it will use. You can change the stock images. You can change the text. He's a photographer, so he's uploaded his own images. But all he's done is it's taken the key points from his blog. I don't know how it does it. Maybe through subheadings. And creates a video for you. And now you can share that on site. I'm really terrified of clicking the next one now. <laughs> okay. This, believe it or not... Oh, the stress, I tell you. This is a video um, which uh, Pets in Silent have made of their podcast. But you could do the same with your blog post. You could do a little audio trailer using this tool, Wave, W-A-V-V-E. You just put in the audio and it makes a little video out of this, like that, with the, with the speechy bit going up and down. So that's another, I've got one more video and it's got my voice in it and I'm terrified now. Maybe I won't play. <coughs> So that's two ways that you could push it out. You could make some images out of quotes, key quotes from your um, blog post. Now, this isn't a very good one because I made it. But, and also, really, I think Square works better because Square is kind of, on all social networks, it kind of works. So, I don't know. But just experiment with things. If you've interviewed someone clever, like I did here, that means that you can take the quotes of the things they said, you can share those out on Instagram, if it's great. you can share it out on Facebook as an image rather than that, you can share it on Twitter, you can share it on Pinterest, everywhere, and it's a new way to drive people in. And actually, stuff like this is important because I'm not sure if you're aware of the new evergreen rules about content on Twitter, but I've made it a lot harder for us to really share the same thing over and over again, so we need to start getting creative about the way we share it. As long as it's not exactly the same text, we can get away with it. I'll talk about that more later on. Um, podcasts. So this is, um, I actually write for Agora Pulse. They're going to come up a couple of times here. You did mention that. That's my disclaimer. They pay me to write for them, which means I get to use the tool for free. But that also means I come up in examples because I see their stuff a lot. They launched a podcast last year. But what I really like about this podcast is they didn't just put in a transcription because actually I really don't like reading transcriptions because they're usually quite rubbish. <coughs> so when they publish a blog post, I like to think this was because of me as well, because this is the way I do it. Just take credit for everything. <laughs> they actually write a proper blog post to accompany it, an interesting to read blog post, with all the ums and the ahs taken out. I don't know how that works from an accessibility point of view, how you feel about that, but for me, I much prefer that. I'm much gonna, more likely to engage with a blog post than read somebody's transcription. You can use SlideShare, which is a, it's like the YouTube PowerPoint presentations. How exciting is that? Um, and this, you could take those key points, those key quotes from your blog post, put one on each slide, maybe put a nice visual in there, and then you've got a piece of content you can upload to SlideShare. SlideShare is owned by LinkedIn, so it's very easy to integrate it into a LinkedIn profile then as well. I'm a bit scared. Because I did this so that when I put my mouse over the, yeah, closure is <laughs> one, one second. So you could make a little. This week on the digital coffee. No, we can't be doing that. Anyway, that's me. Look at the expression on my face that I stopped doing as well, I tell you. So um, every week I do a Facebook live show and I run a little trailer on my Instagram stories about what I'm going to cover this week. Also do this with blog posts. Pick out the key things that are in the blog post. On the blog this week, blah, blah, blah. If you're lucky enough to have 10,000 followers, you can ask them to swipe up. If you don't have 10,000 followers, you can um, ask them to go and visit the link in your bio. Number six, 
reignite your content. So, what have we done so far? Anyone remember? Because I can't. We've audited, we've, re we've evaluated, we've rehashed, and we've reformulated. Thank you. Now we're going to reignite the content. And this is a problem a lot of bloggers have. You write a blog post, you publish it, you push it out onto all your social networks, and wait, and then that's it. If it ranks on Google, great, you'll continue to get traffic from that. Actually, Pinterest is doing a bit of that now. I'm not sure if you're using, I don't even use Pinterest. I've seen my traffic go up, it's still tiny, but go up threefold <coughs> from Pinterest recently, so definitely worth looking at that from a search engine point of view. But unless you manage to rank in those search engines, it's dead, isn't it? It's just sitting there. So you need to have a plan for reigniting that content, for resharing that content. And also, you can advertise that content, because now you know that that content is related to a specific product, you can build that into that ads funnel that I showed you earlier. Except for... <laughs> Every time I set up a Facebook ad, I go into this mad panic. Oh my God, I'm wasting so much. Wait, I'm not wasting money. I'm making sales rip. But they, does anyone else have that feeling? Or is it just me? Am I weird? <laughs> ah, okay, I'm weird. That's, people told me that before. Right, okay. So you can reshare your content for free. Set up a resharing schedule. So whenever I write a blog post, I have this really ugly looking spreadsheet where I categorise each blog post. Like, there's more to it than this. There's the title, there's the link and everything. And it will categorise each blog post for its resharing value. So is it evergreen? Great, that means I can just put it into a loop of content that I reshare. If it's seasonal, I need to set it up for you know Christmas, Easter, um, procrastination day, whatever it happens to be. Is it topical? If it's topical, it's probably, you know, it is over quite quickly. It can drive a lot of traffic right while it's topical, but you know, in a week's time it's dead. Still worth having on your site though, because people will look for these for information about these historic events that have happened. And then I have this last section which is really catchily named check for updates. And that just means before I reschedule it out again, I just go and have a look, make sure it's still up to date. Now that I have that, I can work out how to reshare that. A couple of tools I use. First one, you know my disclaimer about this, Agora Pulse, but they actually just launched this new, I think it was about a couple of months ago, they launched the bulk upload tool, which they've never had before. I've used the one on Hootsuite. Who's a Hootsuite user? This is better. And I'm not just saying that because they paid me to blog for them either. You can add your RSS feed to this. And when you bring in your RSS feed, it drags in all your content from your blog, every single post. And you can choose from those which ones you would like to share out on social media. You can schedule them, you can change the headlines. And that's the thing about Twitter, it's kind of hidden away, because I wasn't convinced of this when they made the change, that they actually don't want you ever to post the same tweet twice. We probably all know they don't want you to post it to two Twitter accounts at the same time, but actually, if you look hard enough, you'll find they don't ever want you to post the same tweet twice. If you want to fly by the seat of your pants, as I like to, I have a, a schedule that goes out like once every month. So I'm kind of going, well, I'll, I can probably get away with that, but there's no guarantee. So the nice thing about this is you can go in, you could edit each headline to make it slightly different each time. And then you can schedule it out. So I'm totally in love with this. I was still, after years of using, of writing for Agora Pulse, I was still using Hootsuite for my bulk scheduling. As soon as this came out and I tried it, I quit Hootsuite. Don't tell any of this. Nobody works. Do you work for Hootsuite? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Co-schedule. Um, it's a plug-in. Again, this is going to be difficult for the new Twitter rules. Um, but you can set up, you can schedule, when you write the post, you can set up scheduling for that to go out over a period of time. <coughs> and then finally, we've got Facebook ads. And um, waste of money, apparently, according to my gremlin. But no, no, they're not. Now you've got your different buckets of content. I use this plugin, Pixel Caffeine. It's from a tool called Adespresso that are ironically owned by Hootsuite. Um, and you can actually set up it to collect audiences depending on which categories they visited on your blog. Again, check out the GDPR compliance on that because I, 
before watching that talk today didn't think it was a problem. I'm not sure now. But that's great, isn't it? Because you know, if people watched, if people visited that blog content about that specific product or service that you sell, there's somebody that now you can remarket to with ads. <coughs> Two stages left. About less than a minute for me to tell you, but there we go. Get evaluated. Because this is the one bit that keeps the content gremlin at bay. He's not turning up once you start doing this stuff. So two tools that I use regularly, I could have gone through hours on Google Analytics, but you don't want that, nobody wants that, is UTM tracking. Does anyone use that already? So for those of you that don't, basically what you do is you can create a version of your link that has some special code at the end that tells Google Analytics exactly where that came from. So each time I write a blog post, I create a different link for my Facebook page, for my Facebook group, for each of the Facebook groups that allows me to share content there, because some of them have asked me to. And uh, For Twitter, for Pinterest, my email list, for my chat bot, I can create all these different ones. And then, this is the URL builder, then when I go into my Google Analytics, I can see where that traffic came from. So from here, I can see that my Facebook ad is delivering um, good stuff. At the end, I've got a goal, which is my Get Readers eBook. I'll show you about goals in a second. And I can actually see that even though it's only four links from Linktree that I use as my Instagram link, even though only four clicks from there, one of those people has downloaded my eBook. And I don't even link to my eBook from that Linktree. So they've gone to my site, they've looked through a few pages, and they downloaded my ebook. So to me, this is a really valuable. Four clicks from Instagram, but one lead. That's good, huh? So that's the sort of information you can get just by creating, and this is uh, the URL builder from Google, that's how you set them up. Just by setting up that and a Google Analytics goal, I can get that information. And I can get that for every single uh, freebie that I give away, and I can get that, even if you don't ask for an email address, and I can get that for every single um, product that I sell. Setting up Google Analytics goals, it's in your settings goals, and you set them up here. It's a quite straightforward process. If you Google it, or if you want a link to show you how to do this stuff, just drop me a DM on Twitter, I'm spider working, and I'll find you a link. <coughs> After I've done that, and that is actually the most rushed phase, but the most important phase, I know I'm doing something right, so I have a happy face. Briefly, I have a happy face. Briefly, because then I look at my results. My results are, I lost loads of that traffic that I had on my blog. That makes me sad. It does make me sad. But I also know that I was manufacturing a lot of that traffic from that one out-of-date, bad blog post that was never going to sell anything. It was just vanity. On good news, I get more referrals. So I'll get two or three referrals a week often from people I've never heard of. And I'm really bad at remembering names. So when somebody says, oh, I've got your name from Mark, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll go and Google it, Google them, and realize I actually don't know them. And that has changed since I changed my blog. Before that, I would get referrals, but I'd always know who it was from. And it's because people are reading my blog and spending more time on my content. And I also, of course, what it's all about at the end of the day is I'm making online sales. I'm making sales through those referrals. I've also launched a few products that you can only buy online, and I've made sales from that. For the slides, I've made a page. You don't get made a really bad page because I couldn't get internet access earlier on. It's just got one link on it. No, you don't need to give me an email. I'm not going to even retarget you with ads. Not now, anyway. <laughs> no, I'm not going to retarget you with ads. That's where you'll get my slides. There is on the sidebar there a sign up for my newsletter if you want to do that.